Good morning. How is everybody? Glad to see you back. I hope the World War One unit went well for you and that you were able to use these videos to really understand better what you read and to really understand the historical context of World War One. Uh, we're now going to start moving on to the interwar period, the periods between World War One and World War Two, And so uh, we're going to kind of update some of the things that we've done around the world uh, in previous units. And for today, we're looking at Unit 8, Section 1, which is about um, the interwar period in Latin America. Now, to do Latin America, what we're going to do is we're going to look specifically at the country of Mexico and understand that this is our example country that really reflects and represents what's going on in the rest of Latin America as well. But we're going to focus more specifically on some of the details for uh, what's going on in Mexico between the, the in the period between World War One and World War Two, so we're going to start actually with a guy that we left off with when it comes to Latin America and specifically Mexico last time. This is General uh, Porfirio Diaz, who of course was a military dictator in Mexico. Uh, he took over in the 1800s after a period of you know lots and lots of instability and revolutions and La Reforma movement uh, from Benito Juarez, who was taking land away from the church and giving it to the peasants. Uh, Porfirio Diaz ultimately said that the thing that Mexico needs more than anything else is stability and to have good relationships with the United States and to get investment from them. And so, of course, what he represents is he represents one of these caudillos, right? He is a, a, a strong man, a, a dictator, and definitely what he represents is the conservatism movement within Mexico. He did absolutely stabilize Mexican society, um, however, it was at the cost of liberty and of freedom, and, and of course it took him establishing a dictatorship. By 1910, people were really at their at, at the kind of end of their patience with Porfirio Diaz. They, they really started to demand, of course, liberals demanded right, rights, socialists demanded you know, equal treatment for people and equal outcomes for people, and so by, by 1910, really, everybody was upset. Uh, with Porfirio Diaz and they wanted something better. Now Porfirio Diaz actually was on a radio show and accidentally announced that um, he was going to hold new elections, real elections, fair elections, and that he would be stepping down essentially is the way that that worked. Now he'd been a dictator for 35 years basically and um, you know all Mexican society revolved around his dictatorship. When he announced on a radio show that he was stepping down, people got very excited and they, they, they were ready to seize this opportunity to get something better. Francisco Madero, who we're looking at here, was a liberal reformer and he was really in favor of these new free and fair elections. Porfirio Diaz was then forced to step down and Francisco Madero was elected in 1911 and he ruled Mexico really for two years as a liberal. He started making social changes, he started promoting more democracy, more freedom of opportunity. He really was an actual liberal who was trying to make things better for the people of Mexico. The problem is of course not everybody was happy with that. And on February the 18th of 1913, General Vittori Victoriano Huerta, who we see pictured here, uh, who was a conservative, with the help of the United States, decided that it would be better to go back to something similar to what Porfirio Diaz had been ruling under with a, with a military dictatorship. So the United States helped him because, of course, it was in the United States' interests to do so, and we he and, you know, with the help of the United States, removed Madero from power. And in the meantime, he arrested Madero and his brother and then took them to a prison for their own safety. Now, on the way to the prison, uh, while they were, you know, in in under arrest, Madero, uh, Huerta's men actually took he and Madero and his brother out to the desert, shot both of them, and just left them there. This really shows you the kind of way that Huerta is going to run Mexico. He's going to be a brutal, violent military dictator. Um, in Mexico today, they still refer to him as El Chacal, which means the jackal. Uh, he he is not popular. He is not loved. People do not like to remember his time in office because it was very, very violent and very, very ugly. And really what this is, is, is this is the start of what we call the Mexican Revolution. This is when Mexicans decide that they're going to have basically a civil war. Um, 
to decide what the future of their country is going to look like. Now, under Huerta, what we see is that two men, mostly from the north of Mexico, their names are Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata, uh, they're sometimes referred to as the banditos, right? Because these guys are outlaws. They're, they're basically trying to fight for the poor people in northern Mexico. They're trying to fight for land rights for peasants. They're trying to fight back against the jackal, against uh, Victoriano Huerta uh, and the, the conservative movement in, in Mexico, as well as the, the influence of the United States over Mexico. To some extent, they were nationalists. Um, these two guys are, are really bandits in the, in the north, and they hide out with the poor people, and they try to, you know, help the poor people. They're almost kind of a Mexican Robin Hood pair of figures uh, for, for Mexico at the time. The problem, though, is that when you're an outlaw, people aren't going to vote for you. People aren't going to elect you into being a government. They, they, they love the banditos. They love Z Zapata and Pancho Villa, but the, they're not going to become the government, right? They're, they're kind of the guys that are sticking it to the government. What these two guys really needed was someone legitimate who could really get elected into government and try to make the changes that they wanted with more legitimacy to their character. And they actually do find a guy named Venustiano Carranza, who's on the left. On the right in this particular slide, we see uh, Emiliano Zapata on the top and Pancho Villa on the north. These three men, Venustiano Carranza and uh, Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa, all rallied together and formed basically an alliance to appeal to the regular Mexican people to look at land reform, taking land away from people who had a lot of it and redistributing it to the poor, so they were to a certain extent socialists. They teamed up and in 1914 they defeated Huerta and took over the government of Mexico. Now, Venustiano Carranza was the guy who was actually going to be the new president of Mexico after 1914. The problem with that, though, is he actually turns around and double crosses Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata and goes after them and tries to have them killed. And basically, he sets himself up to be the new dictator of Mexico. And he continues to rule as a dictator until he passes a new constitution in 1917. <clears throat> now, that new constitution does at least stabilize things. It does technically end the Mexican Revolution, but of course 1917 is another big year that we should remember because of course this is when the Zimmerman telegram comes out. This is when Americans were worried about Mexico attacking the United States, which really after the Mexican Revolution, which kills millions and millions of people, that was just never going to happen. But after the Constitution of 1917, we do see some stability come to Mexico. Now, the next really big event happens under a man named Plutarco Elias Calles, who in 1929 establishes the PRI, the Party of Institutionalized Revolution. So he's going to turn Mexico into a socialist country. One of the big targets that Calles went after was the Catholic Church. He and the socialists felt that the Catholic Church had too much power too much land, and too much influence, and that they were going to try to separate the Catholic Church from the, the government and from the people to take their land and to redistribute it back to the peasants. In response, though, conservative Mexicans, and actually a lot of very poor Mexicans as well, felt that their government was making them choose between their government and their religion, and many of them chose to go with the side of their religion. This, in the 1930s, started an event called the Cristeros War, C-R-I-S-T-E-R-O-S, -E the Cristeros War. The Cristeros rebels were, were warriors for Christ, is, the, is what that means in Spanish, and they were fighting against their own government, and their government was trying to remove the influence of the church and of their religion over Mexico, and they were fighting back against their government to support the Catholic Church. Now, this ultimately becomes a very bloody civil war, essentially, in the 19, well, late 20s and early 1930s. Between 1926 and 1934, at least 4,000 priests were killed or kicked out of Mexico itself. Um... Before the Mexican Cristeros War, there were about 4,500 priests altogether. Um, in 1934, there were only 334 priests that the government actually extended licenses to to be able to serve the 15 million or so people that actually lived in Mexico. The rest of those priests were either 
emigrants, they left Mexico, they were kicked out of Mexico, they were executed, or they were assassinated. By 1935, in Mexico, 17 of their states actually did not have a single priest of at, at all uh, in the entire state to service, you know, the humongous numbers of Catholics that they had. So what we see here is in Mexico, and of course in the rest of Latin America, it's really no different than what we see in Mexico, but what we see is a lot of political instability, a lot of conflict, a lot of fighting, a lot of really unhappy people, and that's pretty typical to go back and forth from one dictator to another in all of Latin America. And, and we don't see a lot of stability. We don't see a whole lot of things that you know they're they're making progress. They're they're moving forward. They're improving things. They're developing. That's a pretty typical sort of thing to be seeing in all of Latin America. Now, in response to this, though, the response is actually really kind of an interesting one because what we see is the development of what we call cultural nationalism. Now, cultural nationalism is by and large a cultural movement, but also it's very much a an artistic movement. It's pioneered by people like Diego Rivera. And Diego Rivera is important and in, in influential in this cultural nationalist movement because what he does is he paints what we call murals. Murals are giant paintings on walls, uh, typically in or outside of a building. And really what Diego Rivera starts to focus on is the history and the culture of Mexico. And what's cool about Diego Rivera is he shows us the good things, he shows us the bad things, he shows us the violence, he shows us the, the amazing cultural things. He puts it all together and says, you know what, being Mexican is really difficult. Not everything in Mexico works out for the best, not everything in Mexico is happy and wonderful, but it's still our culture and we should still be proud of it and being Mex it's good to be Mexican right it's it's good to celebrate the things that make us who we are even if those things aren't always the nicest and the best things to do so the mural here of course we see things like the Spanish conquistadors and the extermination of the natives we see the socialist uprisings we see um, the Porfiriato, which is the, the, the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. We see the Mexican Revolution. We see all of these things, the good, the bad, the in-between, all of them being celebrated together to say, you know what, it's hard to be Mexican, but it's good to be Mexican. And Diego Rivera really is the, the kind of leader in this movement, right? This is another mural. This is actually in Mexico City itself. This celebrates the kind of greatness of the Mexican Aztec empire and to kind of remind people, hey, don't forget, we used to be one of the biggest and most powerful empires empires on earth and, and just to, to celebrate that and to remember that as well, right? Uh, here we see, you know, this is a mural which is about the exploitation of Mexico from conquistadors and from wealthy people and, and to a certain extent this is kind of a, a pro-socialist uh, uh, mural, but again, he he is celebrating all things Mexican, right? Here we definitely see the, the mural of workers at the crossroads, right? You see Karl Marx, you see people like Leon Trotsky from the Russian Revolution. Uh, Trotsky, of course, was trying to spread the Socialist Revolution to Mexico. In fact, he was killed in Mexico City itself by agents of Joseph Stalin. Right. This is Jose Clemente Orozco. This is a painting of Father Miguel Hidalgo, who hopefully you guys remember. Father Hidalgo was the guy who was preaching the Grito de Dolores, which was the 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 kind of complaints of the poor people under the Mexican uh, uh, the Mexican people under the Spanish Empire. He's really the firebrand that starts the Mexican Revolution against Spain. Right. All of these. Um, both from Orozco and from Diego Rivera, they represent to us this concept of social, of cultural nationalism, which again is the idea of it might be hard to be Mexican, and again, we see this in other Latin American countries too, but it might be hard to be Mexican, but we should also be proud of being Mexican. We take the good things, we take the bad things, and we celebrate who we are, and we appreciate who we are, and that's what's really, really important, is that Mexican people really find their identity in their struggle and in the challenges that they're facing in their lives. So I hope that you liked this video. I hope that you found it to be useful for uh, Unit 8, Section 1 on uh, the, the struggles in Latin America. Next time, we're going to look at Africa and the Middle East as it, when it comes to nationalism in, in uh, Africa and the Middle East for Section 2. And I hope everybody's staying safe. I hope everybody is staying healthy. Um, feel free to like and subscribe and leave a comment here. Also, if you guys have any questions, please leave those on Google Classroom so that I can answer them and everybody can see both your question and my answer to help streamline that process as we continue to move through our curriculum. 
I will see you guys in the next video.